welcome to this month's edition of Words of the Wise. Uh, this month we are tackling the subject of gender in theater, and much like race in theater, we have broken this into two parts because it's kind of a big topic. For our first video, we are interviewing Jen Lanier and Kate Mira, and we hope you enjoy this interview. And welcome to Words of the Wise. I'm Sarah Andrews, and I'm sitting here with Kate Mira and Jen Lanier. And uh, <laughs> this month, our topic is gender in theater. And this is part one, because much like race in theater, this is a two-part conversation. So um, <laughs> why don't you two let everyone know who you are? Jen, you've been on Words of the Wise before, but it's always nice to hear a little synopsis anyways. So, Oh, sure. No problem. No problem. Uh, yeah, I, uh, Jen Lanier, I, I uh, use she, her pronouns uh, mostly, though I do identify myself as a female to spirit person, um, uh, just to be, you know, clear. Um, I have been working in Portland theater for about 13 years or so, um, 12, 14, 13, something like that. I uh, presently am a co-artistic director of Original Practice Shakespeare Festival, and uh, that is something that I brings a lot of joy to my life. It's work, but it makes me very, very happy. Um, I, do, um, I do theater in town. I do some films, you know, the odd TV show and all that kind of great stuff. And yes, I am aware that Jenny Weasley the cat is right there. Um, I have no control over this cat. So, you know, what you get is what you get. <laughs> I have no idea what the ratings for this are, so I'm going to uh, squelch all of the, the possible word play. They were with- all in my head, baby, all in I- my head. No, no. Like we have we have that we have that shared ops vocabulary experience, even though right. I was there right before you came in. Um, My name is Kate Nira. I also use she, her pronouns. And I am the artistic ambassador of Fuse Theater Ensemble. I also have my own uh, business, Kate's Theatrics, and am a union stagehand with IATSE Local 28. Um, Well, thank you, yeah. Uh, Unions in the house. That is a whole other side conversation, uh, a whole different conversation. Yes, those eyes, Jen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think I touched upon everything that you wanted in an intro. Yes, Sarah. Yep, just a brief. Who are you? <laughs> so, um, so you two are here today, like I said, to talk about gender in theater and gender yeah. in theater. Uh, we can go a lot of different directions with this conversation but let's just for now stick to like the mission of this little program which was if you could talk to a younger you Mm. about this topic what would you say to them and why like what experiences got you to this point right now Oh yeah, you know th- this is this is one. This is definitely one of them. That's um, such a such a giant. It's such a giant thing for um, for young folk in in the theater, uh, actors, stagehands, uh, designers. Um, yeah, gender. We we want to we want to act like. Uh, that you know gender isn't a thing that matters uh presently but um i know it has and i know it it does and i know that with with my little self um coming into the world of of uh theater i had a very my intro to theater was uh very protected i um i did my first few plays at uh a historically uh, a black university, uh, the North Carolina Agriculture and Technical State University in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, where I, I, the first thing I did 
on a stage with other people was uh, being a kid and the king and I. Many people have this <laughs> experience, right? And, um, you know, like I said, with, uh, the, the director was someone my family knew. Um, we were at the college where my father was also an administrator. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a, an environment where everybody was watching out for these kids and everyone. Very, very, very safe situation. Um, really pleasant. Uh, so it, it was shocking, uh, some of those early pieces that um, – that happened in the theater as far as gender goes. I mean, first of all, um, with I, I was I've always been attracted to um, to stuff that uh, is defined by a lot of people as masculine, um, uh, defined by a lot of folks as male. You know, uh, I've always been attracted to roles that had lots going on with it. You know, interesting stuff, meaty stuff. I was, you know, getting Shakespeare read to me as a little kid. So, um, you know, I grew up thinking I was going to play Hamlet, you know, like as soon as I got to college. Like, of course. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and what a shock to discover that, um, that people thought that that was just a ridiculous thought. You know, well, of course you can't. Why would you even think that? What's wrong with you, right? Mm -hmm. And and also discovering that um, in the world that I came up in, playing girls meant that also that I had to put up with um, harassment. Just to to be clear, just to make it um, uh, simple, um, that harassment from uh, directors um, and from other actors uh, and and that this was just uh, it was handed to me as though that this is just part of things this is just the way it is you just have to get right I mean you're really in the theater aren't you I mean you just have to cope with that stuff and, and you know as though um, uh, respect was not a part of the conversation you know, um, thought and care wasn't a part of the conversation or even expanding out of the idea of uh, of what a human being who um, is me could possibly do on the stage. So, yeah, there were some um, well, stuff, and we could get into some uh, details in a minute, but I don't want to, you know, take the whole <laughs> chunk here about the beginning, but just uh, suffice it to say that uh, in the beginning, it just seemed like the only way that I could get on a stage was to start off not being me. And I, I understood working characters, and that made perfect sense to me. But mm -hmm. apparently from the moment I walked in a door of some place, that the expectation was that I would not come in presenting myself ever, ever, that I had to present this idea of what a Jennifer Lanier ought to be. Mm. Oof. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that. And as, as actors, we already, We already have to have to do so much and be so empathetic and be so open and be so aware. And part of the work of being an actor is then having the ability to easily come back to yourself that hear, hearing that and imagining, imagining all of the multiple layers in there are just like, <laughs> and and um because because my experience while I definitely had I definitely had those thoughts they were thoughts in my head rather than blatant outside expectations of me to change. Mm -hmm. And mm. Um, yeah, so my, um, my experience with gender in theater is um, 
one where I have a lot of privilege. Um, I have light skinned privilege. I have heteronormative privilege because when you look at me, people don't automatically guess that I'm queer. And so they, it, while the like romantic leads and things were not necessarily the ones that I wanted because I also love playing the pants roles in Shakespeare and give me some Beatrice in Servant of Two Masters. Like I'm, yes. And, (laughs) um, but because of how others perceive this look of mine, it, it was, um, if I, if I, if I had harassment, it was not blatant. And mm. if it, if, if it affected, if it affected things in the casting room and why there are tons of roles that I think I should have been cast for that I wasn't, you know, I don't, um, I don't, I don't, I don't know them. They are, they are fabrications and assumptions of my own brain. Um, And I was honestly pretty uh, clueless in a lot of ways about gender when I was a young actor starting out. And so in that way, I actually think that the current like new generation of actors coming into the fray that have a wider vocabulary of Mm. sex and gender expression that have a broader acceptance. Like one of the things that I have uh, commended and lauded about living in the Portland metro area that is so diametrically different to what I experienced going to high school on the East Coast was um, in the late 90s was sure there were queers, but we were either closeted or cheeky about it. Like Mm -hmm. it was, it was, it was a joke and you didn't know, like only a handful of people that we really trusted knew or didn't know. And like, right, right, like right, we, right. We, we, we played that, we played that line and that mm-hmm. is a line that I can play and mm-hmm. just presenting as I am that has a, that has a, a, a more acceptable vein to it than right, right, right. other types. Um, and So one of the things that I would encourage of my younger self is one to remember and learn because at that point it wouldn't have even been remembering because it wasn't, it wasn't known or talked about that there are more than two sexes. There are more than two genders. There are so many combinations therein. Like I was reading, I was reading this uh, biologist and all of the chromosomal differences and, but, and I'm like, <laughs> and, and all of that is exactly as it should be. And, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, that there are, since we are, since we are in a Shakespeare vein, there are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamt of in your philosophies. You know, I, that is uh, so true. Yeah. So I, I'm just going to interject here real quick because mm-hmm. I think that this is really interesting to find like this difference between this, the two of you, this privilege mm. difference between the two of you, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, in your experiences. And I know that, you know, speaking from my experience, um, I, you know, I have brown hair, right? I'm tall, I'm big boned, and lots of people don't know this, but I got my freaking undergraduate degree in acting, like, I got a BFA in performance. Right, right. um, And, you know, the experience that I had was I was told that if I wanted to be castable, I needed to dye my hair blonde and lose, Uh. like, 20 pounds. Uh. And so that created a whole thing. And then once I did do that stuff um i faced some really awkward things like i was cast in an indie film 
and there was a sex scene and uh. uh the camera person i guess the director wasn't paying attention i'm not quite sure what was happening but like the camera person made me do that take um 11 times so he had me like fake an orgasm like 11 times and by the 12th time i'm like is this necessary yeah. <laughs> what? Yes, right. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, because we're so we're so used to that that pe I mean, we're we're not just used to we're we're groomed into always saying yes. I mean, you know, Kate knows. You know, uh, in improvisation, that's a that's a giant um, that's a giant rule of play, right? Is to make sure that the answer to whatever you're offered is yes, and you know, continuing. Uh, and, and the problem though is that we aren't groomed we aren't taught early that while that applies to the work as you're working it doesn't mean that in between takes if you're doing a film or um in between scenes that uh it's okay to subject it is to to be subjected to objectification it's not okay to be subjected to and you know to um any any kind of uh touch that's unwanted it's not okay to be subjected to kisses that aren't wanted or or to be told things that are shaming and and upsetting you know i mean i think about i think about those things and and, and gosh i would do that i would go back in time and I would talk to Jenny because that was how everybody uh, referred to me back in uh, North Carolina. I, I would tell Jenny, I'd say, you know, girl, tell them to go to hell. Seriously. <laughs> tell those people to go straight to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Don't do it. Because, cause, I mean, I remember uh, there was a show, uh, uh, Summer and Smoke if you're familiar uh, with uh, Tennessee Williams, you know, one of those shows. And and and, uh, and I was asked in college, I was asked to play uh, this character, Rosa, who is a Latina. Um, and um, I'm not, but, you know, I was brown enough. So what the hell? <laughs> one of those things, right? And, and, and they put me in this, this dress, this pink dress that went on and on and on and on. And that was very interesting. I mean, it was interesting to work the problem of a dress with lots of material to it and do the thing. And they put fake breasts on me because my breasts are not very large and they needed this to happen. And there was a whole thing about that. And so we get to it and, you know, you're having tech or whatever, you know, and so you have to sit there, stand there for a while. And you're standing for a while in the position while people are adjusting lights and such. And I cannot tell you how many people are like, whoa. Jenny, whoa! See, you got to do that. You got to dress like that. You got to have makeup on. You need to make sure your hair is always down, and because I used to have very, very long hair, kid. You know, because that's how you're really pretty. That's how you're attractive. And it's like, whoa, that's interesting. I don't have any interest in people who look like you, but okay. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm supposed to do, but I was also not out then either. So it was, that was a little time of spending, which was another part of the internal and external harassment was um, mm -hmm. pushing away the very natural butchness, you know, and, and, and that. And it's like, well, if you can do it there, why can't you just do it in your life? <sighs> uh -huh. I would tell, I would, I would tell my younger self, is like <laughs> say to them well i can commit murder on stage so i guess i should think why can't i just do that in my life <laughs> you know it's about how much sense it makes <laughs> yeah and what you said oh my gosh it also highlights something that is so insidious not just in our industry but in our socialization uh, uh, like being socialized female, regardless of identity, of there being this expectation that you should, that your looks are more important than your talent and your acting right. skills and right. your dialect skills and how many different weapons we can each use in stage combat certification. Oh and like all, 
how about how about let's remember the holisticness of all of us as artists and uh, and and like do the work yeah how do i look is my genetics and choosing to put on a little bit of makeup today right like my work is all of the decades that I have put into study and training and observation of the human and ecosystem condition and how it all weaves together. And, mm-hmm. and I feel like I was, I was really lucky in the sense that I, ha- I have an incredibly supportive family for all of the different sides of myself and I, um, one of the things that most of the people watching won't know about me is that my dad was in a horrible accident when I was a kid. And one of the silver linings of that horrible experience was realizing the, the true meaning of community because we had friends and neighbors, like they were all there. We didn't have to buy groceries for a year. Like legitimately, I have a solo show where I have a whole pantomime of casseroles. It is based in reality. It's not <laughs> an exaggeration. And what that did was that, that, that gave me this foundation of that so many people don't have, and especially people who ha- who have gender expressions that are outside of the norm. Right, and right. I had this foundation of security that even when things get horrible, I'm gonna be okay mm. because they're, it's, it's not just my mom, my grandma, my dad, and I. It is them and all of the neighbors and all mm-hmm. of their teachers mm-hmm. and all of the church that my parents went to at the time. And that level of security and safety at a young age I, I truly did not realize how formational they were. And it's, this, is, this story veers a little away from gender, but where it ties back in is how I've been able to recognize and empathize with those that haven't had the kind of foundation support that I've had to be able to to try and help foster that where I can and Mm. like and and so like if in tying this back to what would I invite my younger self to do is to 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 be a little more aware of the different expressions and um experiences of others around me because one of the things that that kind of trauma did for me anyway was really put me into my own experience Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. one of the ways that helped was when I was getting the expectations of look and not getting cast for roles that I thought I should be I was able to slough them off Mm -hmm. relatively easily but at the same time, it also made me um, less aware of the great variety that was out there in all of my fellow sure. peoples in this world. Oh, yeah. Well, sure. Well, sure. I mean, and I think about, you know, I think about um, uh, the way that, you know, you, you touched on just a little bit that uh, there's an expectation that um, men in our profession uh, can be everything, can be a wide, wide, wide range of humanity, can take in so many different things, you know, and, and, and we as women uh, so often have been relegated to a smaller world, 
right? A smaller world of, of type, a smaller world of people, a smaller world of even of uh, expression, I mean, something that I've noticed is that, uh, I mean, I actually, if I had, <laughs> I was just thinking about this, uh, even after I was out and, and very clear about being who I was when I wasn't on the stage, uh, I was uh, doing a show down in Florida and um, at a cool theater in St. Pete, and the woman was constantly on me about how strong I was. About, it's like your presence is just overwhelming on this thing. You're just you're just bullying over this guy, and and you know it's like okay, I'm sorry, I will try to not do that, and and you know so you're working right, you're working, and we had one scene where there was a lot of intensity, and then there was a whole physical thing that had to happen, like he was supposed to overpower me and and all this stuff, and then other things occur. Well. <laughs> So the director, who has me in like a bra and a slip anyway, which is a whole thing. One day she said, Jen, is there, I need you to not allow your muscles to flex in your arms. Because it is so clear that you are so ripped that you can, obviously you could tear this guy in half. So if you could allow yourself to not engage your muscles, maybe I can make a believable scene where he overpowers you. And I thought about that for a moment, and I thought, okay, so I have to flip and fall and pull, and turn, but somehow not engage my arm muscles so I don't – maybe you should have cast a bigger dude. Maybe you should be working on – his performance and energy more than yours. Right. The, and and that's one of those pieces where she didn't go to him and say, can you like, you know, uh, butch it up, bud? I mean, you know, she, that wasn't, that wasn't the understanding. That wasn't the social contract, right? That uh. the social contract was I had to soften and small and stuff. And actually, in my uh, in in, in uh, one of my solo shows and none of the above, I do a whole piece about what presents uh, what presenting as a girl is. And and I have the audience come with me on this little journey of, you know, it's a thing of okay, what what do you know about women's voices? What tells you a woman's voice is this way? And we and, and then I modulate my voice down to the things that they call out. And then I talk about about walk, and I modulate my walk to the way that they call out. And then I present that, you know, and 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 it's just, it's because it just seemed like. And in that show, I do it for comedy. I do it for the laughs. You know, I want the people to laugh along while I'm saying, and by the way, do you do that? Do you do that to some youngsters? Do you do that to some young women? Do you tell in in ways, maybe not every word, but do you intimate mm -hmm. to young women that maybe they shouldn't be so much? Mm -hmm. I mean, how many times have we heard that? God, you're, you're, you're too much. Mm -hmm. I mean, my God, you're so much. It's like, um, I, had, I had a classmate who was, I, I would always do the comparison with my instructors in conservatory. And I'd say, well, you never tell Stoney that he's too much, you know. And, um, you know, and because he's a big old guy, the big old voice and all that stuff. And, and um, I just, I, I, you know, I, I, and I do, I actually do. I do talk to young young women actors all the time about don't ever hide your 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 amazingness don't ever hide it i mean you might choose to do things and shape and carve and all sorts of stuff but let it be a choice you know walk into that room like you own it you know i do i do a <laughs> I, I do a um audition uh workshop for uh people of color because why not and um, and it's Portland, so uh, and and it's it's so much fun to to talk to people and coach folks to walk into that room like you own that son of a gun, like 
like you just like it's yours because like an audition is a role you've already won so show them that stuff you know Mm -hmm. show them that coolness show them that awesomeness you know and um show them that look i know i know that i am worth your time y'all prove to me that you're worth mine Mm -hmm. walk in like that and see what that does and and i love i loved watching the results of some of that um when I watched auditions from some of those people. And it was beautiful watching those young women just take that thing and then do all sorts of stuff in the audition. But God, you know, um, yeah, I, I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I find really fascinating, Jen, about uh, the similarities that you and I have taken over our creative careers is that we have both created our own work and we yes. have both created, yes. we've both created solo shows. We've both devised out there to share the expressions of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't want to, I don't want to make any assumptions as to other motivations of yours. I would love to hear what they are, but at least for <laughs> myself, I know that part of it, was not getting cast in roles and with by companies that I was interested in and then being invited to become part of the formation of Fuse and in our history because of a lot of financial stuff we like dove into solo and original work for financial reasons and for personal reasons. And so there is, there is this freedom of expression and storytelling that I find so important. And one of the things that I, um, another thing that uh, some watchers may not uh, know about me is that I'm a witch and in, one of the pagan traditions, there is something called oast, uh, toasts, boasts, and oaths. And, um, and it's a time to tell stories about yourself, about things that you are super proud that you've done. And that kind of autobiographical story sharing is not something that we have in this culture in a, in a larger sense. We have it in all sorts of small senses in our, in our small groups of friends and things like that. And that is hugely valuable. I, I, I am saying this not in any way to detract from that, but to notice that there is something very different about the experience of hearing someone's autobiographical story and hearing its truth and learning learning the huge array of experiences out there from gender, which we're talking about to everything else, and versus watching movies or watching Netflix or um, or even you know reading fiction and such the, there is there is something I don't I don't have the English. For it, I just have the <laughs> sensations in my body of the difference yeah. in having those autobiographical story shares that yes. is so potent. What oh, what gigantic. brought you to it, Jen? Oh gosh, well honestly, Whoopi Goldberg. To be perfectly honest, <laughs> um, I was uh, you know because yes. y'all know I'm old, so um, her original uh, the original piece that people saw of hers was a show that she created and called Spook Show, um, which is just marvelous. And then, um, what's his name? Was it Mike Nichols who saw it and brought it um, into the New York Theater and onto Broadway? And that was a show that we know as Whoopi Goldberg. Um, And uh, those characters that she was playing, uh, you know, all these different people, not all of them women, which was really just like, Okay. I mean, and I, and Lily Tomlin as well in her work. Um, I mean, uh, Purvis, uh, the, the um, 
uh, a nightclub. Search for guy. Intelligent Life in the Universe? Oh, Search for Science, yes, yes. And all of the characters that she created, many male, many female, all through that. Um, that was the next, that was the next time I saw someone do work like that. I thought, well, dude, this is, this is the way to go, right? And, mm -hmm. and I told stories to a friend of mine who's a director. I was, I would always, because we traveled, we traveled, we did, we did um, theater for young audiences for uh, about seven years together and traveled all over the South doing this. And so we had a lot of time to talk and I tell him stories about my childhood and just crazy, crazy wild stuff. And uh, one day after a round of stories, he was sitting there going, you know, Jim, there's a show in there. And it's like, oh my God, you mean like Whoopi Goldberg, like, like Search for Signs. It's like, yeah, yeah, there's a show in there. So we spent the next couple of years um, playing around with that. I, uh, I, I just tried to find what the stories were and he would see them and he would help me hone the pieces uh, uh, down and and we found a through line and you know all those things that you do with the show right and and that's another thing to see that i would tell my younger self it's like don't sit about waiting for someone to give you a freaking role i mean mm -hmm. because that's how you turn into um a, a growly bitter person and mm. and and that's not how your art's going to get out. I mean, create your own work, you know, create your own project. Um, get with some friends and and make some stuff yourself. I mean, even in college, we did things like that. It's like, well, we weren't getting cast and stuff. It was like, I right, let's do a show together, a bunch of women. I hadn't even thought about that in years. But we, um, a bunch of uh, young women, we just got together and said, let's do this. Let's just do this. Did and you do Hamlet? Stole time, like after other shows were done, and got on the stage to do it. We were like the late, late night, you know, thing. It was <laughs> awesome. Awesome. It was awesome, you know. And I would, I would share that, and I do share that with youngsters anytime. It's like just, and not just, but go ahead and generate your own projects, and and you can start with your own story, like you're saying, Kate. You can start with your your own stuff because everybody has interesting stuff that's yeah. happened in their life. Yeah. And why not share that with other people? Why not put that together and find, you know, find the art in that? Um, mm -hmm. And especially young women, because I, I, you know, I, it's funny, my wife and I, we, we, we watch TV late at night together. It's a little thing we do together and we go, okay, so tonight, are we going to watch our stories? Or are we going to watch guys blow up stuff? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like, Cause, yes. okay, because we'll go either way, depending yeah. on what you're feeling, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, and so when, when I find uh, 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 films where uh, uh, women blow up stuff, I'm always delighted. Uh, because, <laughs> you, know, in, in, you know, those sorts of things. I love, I love that groups of women together doing something, trying to make a thing happen, which is what heist movies are, aren't they? You know, mm -hmm. um, and so it's fun to watch women heist movies, I find. Um, but yeah, I tell people, you know, make your make your own thing. I mean, obviously, you know, Sarah, you paid attention to that because you said, well, shoot, let's me and my friend make a theater. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, mm -hmm. that's more or less the story. I, I think that one of the things that's really special about what you two are talking about is you started your own projects, you did your own thing, and you didn't wait for someone to give you permission. Uh -huh. Right? Because uh -huh. I think that one of the big traps <laughs> that theater creates, and it's a trap, is thinking that you have to land a role in order to be a theater artist, or you have oh, to, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you have or to validate yourself. Job to get it to be a theater artist like you mm -hmm. have to work for a company to be an artist but that doesn't define you no. oh god no no not yeah. even close i mean you know my little buddy who uh, uh uh started original practice shakespeare you know um my my co-artistic director i mean he just he wanted to do some some shakespeare in this cool way that he had uh studied over in 
the Northeast somewhere, and then he was moving here. It's like, oh, this is really cool. Let's do this. And, and it was just a bunch of, it was a bunch of buddies getting together to do some free Shakespeare out in the parks. And it's like, oh, we'll just pass the hat and whatever. You know, yep. and now it's, you know, it's more, right? It's more. And and we have a lot of women in our company. We got like 65% women, right? And um, and people who do not define themselves as men uh, in our company uh, as well. So um, there's a lot of that reclamation going on uh, mm -hmm. in that crew. There's a, there's a lot of, of, of claiming your space and claiming, claiming your strength or claiming your vulnerability or claiming, mm -hmm. you know, um, there were a couple of guys who were, it was so wonderful. I think, I think actually they, they, um, they were identifying as non-binary and uh, were saying, you know, I, I, I just always, I mean, I just always wanted to play Juliet, you know? I mean, I always <laughs> wanted to try that. Mm -hmm. and so I was like, okay, well, I think that's cool. Let's, let's do a, my wife likes to call it Romeo and Julio, you know, <laughs> let's do that version, which we did for a yep. fuse one time for their, um, their Pride Month uh, extravaganzas. Um, yeah, you know. Ops has been a partner with Outright Theater Festival almost all of the years, I think. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much, yeah. yeah. So we don't got a lot of time left. Oh, good Lord, okay. I know, <laughs> hours just <laughs> flies by. Um, but before we go- We can talk about this stuff for a long time. <laughs> oh, child, you know we can. <laughs> um, before we go, I just want to touch really briefly on uh, collaboration because mm. I have found that for me um, one of the biggest struggles that I have seen people go through and that I've gone through myself is how do you know when someone's being an ally and when someone's trying to push you into a stereotype Ooh, that's gorgeous you know it it's it, it 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 doesn't sound like a fine line when you say it out loud, but yeah, it's such a fine line. So yes. I was wondering if y'all could just speak to that just a little tiny bit. Oh sure, sure. Um, you know, uh, uh, I've I spent a, a lot of time because all of the stuff that I tell funny stories about. Um, meant that I had to uh, work with a psychiatrist for about three and a half years in order to be able to continue living and and producing um, anything from my heart. And so, you know, one of the, the, the pieces that I got out of that work was was actually learning to listen to the incredibly quiet, small bit of me. Yes, there really is a small, quiet bit of me. Um, and uh, and when when that quiet, small bit of me, when presented with something, gets this little, and it's not much. It's it's like God. I was about to. I was about to. It's like when you're trying to palpate an ovary, and you know it's so little and so you can barely just. But that's okay. Um, uh, it's just a, it's a very small something that just goes eep, when something's not quite right. And I ignored that for so long and so often. I would ignore that because, like, well, you know, I'm, I'm a whatever the fuck. I can do things. I can push through. Ha ha, look at me. Yeah, no. No, 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 no. Nowadays, the second I feel that that's, mm, I think I'm going to just step back a second and I feel I must ask a question. And that question's going to be why? And then stay real quiet and give someone time to start talking to me about why we have to do this this way. Why is this need to be presented like that? Why is it crucial crucial that the entire audience sees this woman's breasts? You know, why um, uh, uh, why is, is, is 
the visual of a rape crucial now and not hearing about it as something that happened off stage i mean why you know it's a lot of a lot of that happens now when i get that is that i ask why and then i sit back and i let someone tell me until they're done telling me you know um it's a great what silence does man mm-hmm. it's great what about you what about you Kate? what about you L- listening listening to that little voice oh goddess bless yes and for years i for years i also ignored that voice Sometimes from the like, I can push through and do this anyway. But for me, what I was more likely to ignore the voice about was thinking that it was, that I was hearing that because of something I was afraid of or afraid of doing. And I am the personality type that if something scares me, that is what I need to do. And so... And that serves me really well in a lot of situations and really badly in others. Mm. And Mm. it, uh, and the trial and error of being able to, to know, to recognize the sensate like when I say sensational I'm talking about it from a like sensorial place and to recognize the sensorial difference between oh I'm afraid of that but that is something that I should do and lean into versus Mm -hmm. oh that's not actually fear that's discomfort that's Mm -hmm. that's Mm -hmm. that's discomfort that's the beginning of red flags of mm. not being respected of manipulation of of x y and you know of x y and z right. and that's 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 actually that's actually the safety part of the fight or flight right thing. this is in right. fact where i should go like Exactly. And listen to that first. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't know if that really, I don't know if that answers your question, Sarah, about the, the difference between allyship and, and not, but so much for, so much for me really comes down to the relationship and comes down to the intention. And Jen, what you were saying about listening to that voice and then asking why and inviting them to share all of it to you so that then you can make the next step in your decision. I think that is so, I think that is so vital. And I think that that also ties into allyship and co-conspiratorialness and how, and how we raise each other up is when when we have that like oh uh, so sure like let's ask let's ask the questions and get the clarifiers before making the assumptions or judgments unless there's a true safety concern and then get the yeah then i'm trying to be really good about not cursing and get out oh i know yeah yeah I mean, the thing, the, the, the thing is that I think it's also crucial is, is if you're in that situation, I mean, you talk about being an ally, if you're, if you're inside of a situation with others and someone has just been asked to fill in the blank and, and that happens in you that, mm-hmm. oh, I have started doing the same thing. It's like, hey, you know, just a second. Uh, you know, I can't help but notice I just saw something in her eyes. And what I saw in her eyes just makes me wonder if maybe there's, there ought to be some hesitation here. Because I don't know about that, y'all. That That's starting to strike me as maybe not a cool thing. And, you know, I'm not trying to read what you're saying, you know, acting partner person. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I just can't help but notice that I saw something happen in you that wasn't cool with this. 
So I thought I'd put that out into the room because people say that now, putting it in the room. And I love it when people say that. So it's like, I started putting things in the room, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. why not? Um, if, if, if the possibility is, huh, if the possibility is avoiding um, helping anybody avoid trauma, I mean, definitely me, but other, you know, other folk do. Yes. And let's do that. And women don't get to do that. Women don't get, I mean, we just don't get cared for as, as well, you know, so um, we're expecting being to be allies care. for each other, I think is, is a big old giant crucial part of this. You know, I, being, you yes. know, being those strong girlfriends, right. Being, being mm-hmm. those folk, you know, who are like, you know, cause your girlfriends, they're going to have your back. Right. And if they have your back at the club, well, they need to have your back on the stage too. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And it take and it what what's 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 the phrasing that is it used so commonly now? Um, less of an emotional toll. Am I remembering that correctly? Mm-hmm. That when the speaking um, the story that you just illustrated, Jen of seeing seeing it in somebody else and and mm-hmm. noticing that in yourself and being like oh that happened at the same time they're not saying something i'm going to say something right now and because it's not actually about me it has less of an emotional toll for me to then oh, I bring that, up and put that into the room yeah. and um and that kind of uh behavior and and support is super helpful for people like me because I am the type of person that in the moment I, 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 I have a tendency to freeze and it takes me a long time to process things. And so if something happens to me in the rehearsal room, I am much more likely to just keep going with things and not actually realize that it was something that I sh- that would have been wise to address at that moment until I'm lying in bed afterwards going, why am I feeling a little odd? Yeah. Oh, and then I will bring it up later, but to have some, to have somebody else in the room who then can serve that up in a different way right. is very helpful for processing types like me. Um, <laughs> right on. We need to go here pretty soon, but I do want to jump on something that you said, Jen, about your girlfriends having your back. Um, Mm -hmm. I just want to say it doesn't matter who you are or how you identify, you can have Mm -hmm. somebody's back. Um, If for the simple reason that, (laughs) and this is a true story, you know, um, there was a show that happened here in Portland where the set designer, um, who was female and pregnant, uh, (laughs) had built this set and uh, the ED came in and said, it's ugly, do it again. And then when she got upset was just like, oh, you're just upset because you're pregnant. Um, <laughs> right, like, so what happened though, what happened though is the lighting designer saw that and went, that's not okay and checked in and then quit the show. Mm. Um, so, and to be clear, I just want to say that out loud because like sure. Sure. that statement, quitting the show because of the abuse of your fellow designer, because of abuse of your fellow scene partner, because like mm-hmm. you see someone mistreating someone because of their gender or their identity or mm-hmm. what have you. I mean, like, I feel like this is my theme for the past couple of months. You're not going to lose work. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Right. You know. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'd love to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, one always hopes that sense can be found and solutions can be found. Um, but when it is absolutely clear that, oh, this is the uh, uh, culture of this place, and it's not okay. Then, oh yeah, I don't, 
I, I have no compunction on, um, yeah, I'm done. It's, it's, uh, yeah, there's no reason to, to, there's some things that you just don't need to push through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I draw a line, I draw a particular line at racism because the racism annoys me. And, um, for good reason. I've, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I, and I've, I've, I've been drawing lines about uh, just blatant freaking sexism and blatant heterosexism. And uh, yes, those things are still <laughs> happening, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which is why we're talking today, because uh, we keep hearing about young folk, you know, uh, having to once again being confronted with, the, you know, these these kind of uh, things that we're talking about that happened you know, maybe 20 years ago for us. And it's, and it's just like yesterday is, is going on or, you know, is about to occur for someone. Mm -hmm. So I think that it is important for us to speak out loud about these things to let, and especially to let, uh, you know, the younger generation coming up know that actually you do have rights. I don't care if it's a union show or a non-union show. Mm -hmm. You have rights. You yeah. have rights as a human. You have rights as a human to expect to be respected all the time, mm -hmm. all the time. You, you absolutely have rights um, uh, to not be subjected to trauma once and certainly not over and over and over, you know, but that's, mm -hmm. that's not, it called acting, it called acting. Not for reeling. <laughs> Not for reeling. It's acting. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Kate, we Kate, we gotta go. Do you have any final words on this topic? Uh, I do not have final words on this topic. In fact, the things that I want to jump off and now talk about are like the importance of having financial security and community security, so that you can feel so that actors can feel and designers and any other creative can feel empowered to say no to that work, to quit the jobs and to not have the fear of not being hired. Stop them from that. And, um, and, and one way of doing that is what Jen and I have done is of creating your own work. Uh, but like that shouldn't, in my opinion, that shouldn't be why solo work and original work is created because of like everything else that is bleh, happening over here. Like I want, I want a healthy system overall. And in a lot of ways that starts from being curious about the brilliant multiplicity of all of these other life forms on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. What she said. <laughs> <That's Jen. laughs> all right. Well, that's all the time that we have. Um, thank you for joining us and we'll catch you next time. Thank you so much for watching please subscribe to the Crave channel. And also, if you can, please donate at cravetheater.org. We are a small nonprofit and we do do our best to make sure that we are paying our interviewees and we have some really exciting projects coming up here pretty soon. Also, if you would like to join our mailing list, please feel free to let me know because we have some other things coming up down the pipeline that are very, very exciting with our company. So again, thank you for your time and have a wonderful rest of your evening and look for Gender in Theater Part 2, which will be released in a couple weeks.